Katja from the Saskatchewan Environmental Society who will introduce tonight's feature. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Katia Vitkova. Uh, I'm one of the organizers of the Sustainable Speaker Series. Uh, and uh, before I introduce our speaker, I want to say a few words about Saskatchewan Environmental Society. So SES, or Saskatchewan Environmental Society, has been operating since 1970s, um, advocating for nature protection and conservation, doing environmental policy reviews, combating climate change, and just generally helping people to live sustainable lives. Uh, if you aren't already a member, uh, we encourage you to join SES. You can find out more about uh, our diverse activities, initiatives, uh, and how to get involved at uh, our website, environmentalsociety.ca. Uh, and if you would like to receive notifications about our series, uh, sustainability speaker series, uh, just email info at environmentalsociety.ca and uh, ask to be put uh, on the list uh, of the reminders. Uh, and we also have a list uh, here on the table to also sign up for notifications. Right, and so our speaker tonight is Dr. Colin Laroc. Uh, Colin grew up uh, in, uh, on a family farm in Duck Lake, Saskatchewan. Uh, he did his undergraduate studies uh, in physical geography at the University of Saskatchewan. His master's and PhD were completed at the University of Victoria, where Colin was studying Pacific Coast environments and uh, becoming a three ring scientist. Dr. Larock uh, has experience of teaching at different universities, and uh, at one of them, he has uh, created a dendrochronology lab. Uh, it was at Mount uh, Allison University in New Brunswick, which became known as uh, one of the main three ring labs in Canada. In January of 2014, uh, Colin decided to move back to Saskatchewan and he also moved his lab to the University of Saskatchewan where he is continuing to do top quality research on trees and climate. Uh, Dr. Larock uh, is also currently the head of soil science department at the College of Agriculture, University of Saskatchewan. <coughs> And uh, tonight, uh, Colin is going to talk about trees in a changing climate. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Masi Cho, thank you very much for having me. Again, um, I'd like to just do my own personal uh, acknowledgement. Again, I'm Métis, so it's very important to me to respect the land and, and welcome uh, everybody and thank you for welcoming me to your land here. Uh, Treaty 6 territory. This is myself up by where they signed Treaty 6. So it's a very uh, special place up by Duck Lake and this is near our family farm and so uh, it's always important to uh, bring that. So maybe a double land acknowledgement tonight. So, so mm -hmm. what I'm going to talk about is our trees in a changing climate but what's also really important is that we're all on the same page. All of us come from different backgrounds and we all have different education levels and so it's very important when we start to talk about climate change, which can be controversial with some people, but I wanna make sure that we're all talking about the same thing, and I wanna kind of, in essence, maybe it's that professor and me teach a little bit about that kind of climate change, and what exactly climate change means in Saskatoon, because if you ask 10 people, you'll have maybe 10 different answers. And so, I study this quite a bit, and as I get into trees and start to think like a tree, it's very important for us first and foremost to kind of understand climate change in Saskatoon. So I'm going to spend a little time on that, make sure we're all on the same page, and then evolve into sort of part two about how those trees are dealing with this climate change. 
So when you start to think about climate change, it's in the news a lot, and you'll start to see these kinds of things, the 10 hottest years on record globally, and you start to look at those things, and you start to um, kind of pick on one or two years, but you'll see most of those years are within the last decade in general. It's getting much warmer, and the most important part of that is globally. When we're thinking about climate change, we're starting to really think global. There's no borders. There's no uh, stopping the smoke from in Alberta to come in Saskatchewan, as you guys are probably, anybody who came today, right? It's there. There's no such borders of, between the US and Canada when you're talking the atmosphere, and this is where we're really at. So when you think about this, it's really good to start at a global level to make sure everybody kind of is on that same page. And I'll start off with that global mentality, and then I'll start to pull it in and get more down to Saskatoon and Saskatchewan. Because again, that's kind of why we're here, and we're the center of the universe, at least tonight. That's the most important place on Earth, is right here. Okay? But these are the kinds of things that you start to also see, you know? Farmers face drought and other challenges in 2021. This is the news from the Star Phoenix. You know, and you'll start to see these things and just, it's just unprecedented events. This is not like the 30s, the 60s, or the 80s, or any of the other droughts we've had in a smaller area. Usually our old droughts used to be one or two places, or maybe a whole section of southeastern Saskatchewan. But by 2021, it was Saskatchewan, the whole thing, plus Manitoba, plus Alberta, and BC parts of that too. So things were really rapidly starting to change, and I wanna to start to try to explain some of that and make sure we're all thinking about the same thing. We tend to think of droughts and uh, summer is when we're seeing all this heat and climate change. But in general, and statistically, that's not really where our biggest changes are. Our biggest changes are happening in the winter. And we're just not kind of uh, uh, up to speed yet on that. And I'll show you a bunch of examples of that and how we start to uh, say that. Yes, it's hot, really hot in the summertime sometimes, but it's generally pretty warm in our summers, right? And to move from 30 uh, to a 33 or 35 feels really bad, but it's only five degree switch. And so statistically, it tends to be not as big as some of the things that we're seeing in the winter, and we'll kind of get into that. The other thing that's important to kind of put a, a line on is weather versus climate, okay? Weather is a weather event that happened yesterday where the wind really shifted this afternoon and it was a huge north wind and I drove into it on my bike all the way home. That was a weather event. We had a shift in weather short term. Climate, whenever you see the climate, a climatology is 30 years. So you'll hear scientists saying, well, we think it's headed this way or whatever. Why? Because we might not hit 30 years yet. It's only been 27 or 26 or 25. And so they'll be very, very scientific about things and they'll say, yeah, we haven't hit a true climatology, which equals 30 years. So not until we see the same thing happening 30 years will we really see that that is technically climate change. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of weather events in Saskatoon, but globally, we can say that climate is changing because our global temperatures are changing and we can sort of prove that. But in Saskatoon and the kinds of shifts we're having in winter, are still kind of some weather events and we're getting closer to a 30 year window but not quite there yet and we'll kind of see that in a few minutes. Okay, the type of things you'll also see when you think of global climate change is this classic they call it the hockey stick, so a long shaft and a suddenly an abrupt turn and it goes up to that blade of the stick goes upwards and we leave in the northern hemisphere from a thousand year window and only in the last 150 years have we hit that blade and it turns up and it gets dramatically warmer very quick. Hard to refute, lots of people have tried, this just seems to be the answer. And it's that last 150 years when globally, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, we've had some dramatic changes. Those changes, again, no surprises to anybody, it starts to become carbon dioxide in the red, uh, methane is really quite bad now, but again, from that 1850s industrial age of coal, lots of coal being used, lots of hydrocarbons being added back to the atmosphere, and we see this dramatic increase, and that slight warming that goes with this is that climate, global climate change that we try to talk about, okay? So again, this is globally. Um, one of the big issues that we've seen is that we shouldn't go over 400 parts per million in our atmosphere. And that 
global thing. They talk through the 80s, they talk through the 90s, early 2000s. Let's not go there, let's not go past 400 parts per million. But by 2014 in March or so, we, we went through. And we didn't really just ease our way through. We blasted through that level and we just kept going. And they said, if we've ever passed 400, we're gonna to start to have all kinds of things that we've never seen, well, for, since the dinosaurs were sort of around. And that atmospheric change would really be bad. Uh, April in 2023, this is our latest stuff. We're up to 422.73, if you'd like to measure it, as of uh, April 4th this year. So we've gone through 400, and we're just climbing, and we're just keeping going. So kind of do, kind of going. Yeah? Uh, how did they arrive at 400? Why was 400 the uh, baseline? Yeah, all the modeling that they did is that if we started to hit that, because they were only modeling what they knew in the past, and we've never hit 400. And they said if we hit 400, we're gonna go into places where we haven't actually modeled and we don't have good records, and so we're kind of guessing. But even when they hit the end of that 400, they said that we'd probably hit at one and a half degrees of warming that we couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And one and a half degrees of warming is gonna be a big change. So now at 422, we're probably closer to two, two and a half, three, depending on who you listen to and the modelers, but we're well past the one and a half. Okay. I love just questions like this too. Yeah. So yeah, don't worry about that and keep asking. So what will that actually look like on the prairies? And here's the CBC. This is from one or two years ago. Uh, CBC uh, 2022, I guess. When they did a thing, what will it actually look like when we get to the prairies? And this is kind of an Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba feel to things. And you know, expect changes in water supply and ecosystems as we continue to warm. Again, a lot of guessing. We haven't really been in this kind of thing and they don't understand how bad it might be or how good it might be and what could be the bad effects and what could be the really beneficial effects. So they're trying to look through this. And they moved through and they tried to guess it. And again, most of their examples were summer where they're kind of missing the point for where all of our data starts to go into. And it's actually our winters that are changing more. Here's some examples from a couple of years ago. This is the the weather network, so if you watch the weather network, and here they were in uh, the fall, late summer and fall of 2021, guessing what the upcoming winter is gonna be like, right? And they have this weather whiplash, was their kind of saying at the time, when it was gonna be some parts of the country really above normal, some below normal, some near normal, and they kind of hit it up that. But what they showed was weather whiplash, and again, that's wonderful, but, and we feel that a lot, weather whiplash, is one of those things that we experience constantly. It's just how big of a weather whiplash, how big is the accident to give you the whiplash, and that's kind of what we'll start to look at a little bit. Do you have a question, sir, or no? No, okay. Here's some summer forecasts, so you'll see that again in the winter comes along, they look ahead and they guess for the summer of 2021, you know, above normal, it's very red stuff, and then we went and had that giant drought that kind of dropped into us that we barely had any rain. It started out a little bit wet in the spring and then it just, we didn't get any rain at all all summer. And it was one of the big uh, droughts. And so great forecast and they called it the big heat. And that kind of happens too. And those two things, that weather whiplash and the big heat are all from the same reason. And that's what I wanna to talk to you guys a bit about. Some of the same reasons of why we're feeling the whiplash and then in the summertime, we get these big domes of heat and they don't move, and it's week after week of hot weather. Um, for those who don't maybe get into the meteorology or get into the weather, you know, a great example of this is, um, you know, tick season, right? This is from the Saskatchewan government, so uh, you know it's true, right? It's obviously from the Saskatchewan government, but tick season is not over yet. And this was uh, October of 2021. Right? And those of you, like, I'm sporting a little bit of gray hair, and <laughs> those of you who have a little bit of time and they can remember back, you know, uh, think back to Saskatoon when you're growing up here, and when was tick season when you were a kid? And the answer, well, we really didn't have tick season, right? Can we kind of agree on that? There was no such thing. If you come from somewhere down Swift Current or Maple Creek or something like that, maybe you had tick seasons down there as a kid, but they weren't quite as bad. And then as you move up north, you know, and you come from a Duck Lake kid, and my grandma lived in the same spot for 99 years, 
And she started seeing her first tick when she was 95, right? All through her kids, she, she had no idea what a tick was, right? And then they start showing them on dogs, and the next thing you know, they're picking them off you when you went for it in the spring, and that tick season is over. And one of that reasons is, again, why we're here, that winter weather. The tick seasons, they can go through their cycles one or two times, already out in the weekend and I had a whole bunch of ticks picking off me already. So we're into tick season, the early spring tick season, and you go up north and you see where they're moving and now Nipawin and Prince Albert and the last few years, uh, La Ronge even. Tick season now is in La Ronge. They're moving and they're migrating further and further north. Reason being, they're not freezing and dying in the winter. We're not cold enough for long enough to kill these things off and now they're moving further and further north. Is that the deer ticks? The is deer, deer ticks, ticks but yeah. yeah. Are we getting any new ticks? Do you know? We're starting to get the ones that are killing the Lyme disease. We're starting to see some examples of those too. Colin, I think that's a photo of the Lyme disease tick. I think that is the one, yeah. Yeah, so uh, they're definitely responding to climate change. They're moving north and east uh, from um, the United States into they, Canada. And who's yeah. the black legged? Black legged, yeah. You can see he's got black legs in back, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they've got these black legs on here, which you can kind of quickly see versus those the deer ticks. Yeah. yeah so the the other one came first, and now these these guys are moving in and. Yeah, and they're bringing with them the diseases, right? Lyme disease, yeah. You see this in the trees too. Do we know the range of the the black legged here in Saskatchewan yet? It depends on who you ask, but they're moving in. They're in Saskatoon already, yeah. um, and they're moving north quite rapidly. Yeah. Friends of mine just came off the ski trail. Yeah, and these kids covered. And for oh, most people, course. you just pick them off and throw them, you don't stop and you see, oh, which kind of yeah. It's like, ah, oh, I got that off of me, right? And so yeah. that's just great. But again, another example of what I'm talking about, except I'm going to use trees as a right? camera. So to explain these tick seasons and these changes, I'm going to go back to the global scale. I'm going to talk about winds a little bit. We've all maybe heard of these, these westerlies. We know what the, the weather in Calgary, Edmonton, it's gonna blow over. That smoke coming from Alberta is our westerlies bringing that over to Saskatoon. And you know, we can see that most of our weather systems move from the west, British Columbia into Alberta, into Saskatchewan and moving off into Manitoba. And everywhere in between them, some of these major wind things, they have um, some polar fronts. So this is one I'm gonna talk about at the polar front or down or north, there's actually four of them. And every time you have a major polar front happening in there or a front between two different major wind systems, you get upper elevation winds that are called jet streams. And hopefully you've all heard of them. You usually will hear them when you're traveling, you know, oh, the pilot will come on and say, we're going from Saskatoon to Vancouver, but we've got a position into the jet stream and so we're gonna be 10 minutes late because you're going into a big headwind. Or you're flying to Montreal or Toronto. Oh, the jet stream's right at our back. We're going to get there 12 minutes early. Why? Because the wind is pushing us as we travel. And so that's happening again, moving from the west to the east. And where that position and how that moves through our year, um, it matters, and it matters quite a bit for our climate. In a typical winter, we'll have that very cold polar air at the north and we'll have warm near the equator. The sun will be in the southern hemisphere. That's where it's really hot. And you usually have a temperature differential. When you have a very high temperature differential from cold air to warm air, you get pretty stable wind patterns. And there's, you get really cold and you cold for a long time and you get these uh, stable patterns. When you flip that and the sun comes into our northern hemisphere, and it comes back into our hemisphere, that hot tide part moves up further north with the sun. And as it does, that cold shrinks down and warm moves up. And so the whole northern hemisphere warms up. And that differential between cold and hot is really decreased. And when that happens, our jet streams do different things. So one scenario in the winter, our jet stream, when it's cold or hot kind of differential, they're pretty stable. But when it gets into this warm and cold, uh, are much closer together, you get a very wavy jet stream. If you were to look at uh, meteorological, if you were pilots all for a minute and you took a look at this, this is kind of a classic upper elevational wind pattern. And this is a classic winter pattern or zonal winds. These little sticks on here with flags sticking out is 
how fast the wind is moving. And the more sticks and the more triangles it has, the faster and the faster the wind. That's roughly, it can be of like 100 kilometers wide pipe of air moving very fast. But what you see is a very zonal flow. This is very cold above, very warm below, and they're separated by that zonal flow of the jet stream. And that's our old system, and that's kind of what we usually have in the winter. Yes, sir. So the jet stream is upper atmosphere wind? Upper atmosphere wind. So think of that a jet airplane flying in there. Yeah. Yeah. But just like if I had like a piece of paper and I was walking by you, and I just went like this with the piece of paper and just kept walking by you, that air, you might feel it. Or if I took a fan and I started blowing air and turned it off, you'd feel a gust come by, even though there's a big difference between us. Okay. And that's the same thing of upper air to the ground level. And so that difference of that air moving, because there's nothing stopping it moving, is how upper air changes can affect what's happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, is faster moving air higher pressure or lower pressure? Um, usually higher pressure. So if you think of like a vacuum, you'll get that vacuum spinning really fast and then you'll be sucking off on the other end and that's the low pressure coming yeah, yeah, the hot. Yeah. 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 So if you go into our summer mode, the technical term here is meridional wind. So if you think of the meridians, you know, west of the sixth meridian, all that kind of stuff, that's the north-south. And you can see now the loop is really big and it's kind of loopy, but this part up and down is no longer a north-south kind of thing with going by latitude. It's actually going by longitude with these kind of zones. And you'll get really cold on this side and maybe hot on this side or warm and hot or whatever it happens to be in the summertime. And if you had this kind of a thing in the wintertime, that's when you'll get really cold on one side and really hot on the other side. And that's the kind of craziness that we've been getting. Okay? So classic summer pattern, but it's changing. This is just another diagram showing the same thing. This is our classic winter jet stream. The wet winter jet stream here would be the dark blue line, and we're looking down at the North Pole. Here's the center of universe, Saskatoon, down in North America. And you can kind of see the wind which is going around, but the loopiness of that kind of blue blob is, is relatively muted. And when you go into a summer pattern, that cool there will still be at the pool, but you'll get much more of these big waves. You'll get much more of that meridional flow. And those big lobes are called Rosby waves, if you're into that. And those Rosby waves start to get big and loopy. And that bigger and the loopier they are, that's when you start to get temperature differentials from east-west, not north-south. Okay? So there's a little bit of things, and I'll, I'll apply it here now, and we'll show you some examples. So here's something from Chicago. It's from NBC News. This, uh, that Arctic blast that's hitting the US, there's a wavy jet stream to blame, right? So that's the title. This is uh, November 12, 2019, right? And the reason they put this is because some homeless people in Chicago, Illinois, froze that night, and that was their story, right? So it was unusually cold in November of that year. And if you go over to the jet stream for November 10th to 15th at that time period, you can see some of those really big waves. That's that gray line in this example. And up here at Whitehorse, way, way warmer. Much warmer than down in Chicago, where those homeless people unfortunately perished. Right? Because one side, east-west, was really, really warm. You cross that line, very, very cold. And how big that Rosby wave, how big that loopiness is, it can go way down into the United States. They can do right crazy things. And this is, again, normal in the summer. We don't really recognize it as much. But in the winter, this is when we get to these really crazy Arctic blasts and all those kinds of things happening. And so it ends up being uh, east-west. And it could be very cold here, very warm here, very cold on the other side. Again, one after another of very unusual kind of patterns versus think of that was just all here and it was only going east-west, cool up top, warm on the bottom, and that's usually what we would get. Since last, we've really been checking since the end of World War II. 
At the end of World War II, we had all these excess airplanes. We had all these flyboys, unfortunately. There was only men were allowed to fly back then, I don't know. And um, what they did is they started going up and saying, oh, how are the winds were up there? Oh, the winds were like this. The wind we understood a lot more about their atmosphere after World War II. And as far as World War II, 1945 onward, the 40s, the 50s, 60s, 70s, we just start saving all this information and it just showed that we didn't get this kind of thing back then. But it's becoming more and more common as we go now. Here's another example. I can have one on just about any week in the winters now. Jet stream, February 4th, 2022. So that's one year ago, roughly. Huge changes, jet stream going all the way down, uh, quite cold in the southern US. But over here we have all of our different symbols. So rain is the slashes, snow is a little kind of star, freezing rain is the triangles. And so in the mountains we had freezing rain, everything else was on rain on this side. Right off the, that line is right over kind of Saskatoon. And on one side of it, it's above zero in the yellows. And then on the other side of it, it's in the blues, so down below zero, because we're in the middle of February, right? And again, a wavy jet stream going off and around across the continent. And if you take a look at the Saskatoon weather information, you'll have extreme cold warning, you know? Uh, when I took this, it was minus 27, but it was supposed to get at minus 36 on the same night, and it's minus 18, minus 18, zero, <laughs> right? Plus two. So in like 24, 48, 60 hours, we go from minus 36 to plus 2. It's 38 degrees change in a couple of days. That's, you know, 38 degrees. If you go to summer and you say, you know, it went up from the high, 28 up to 35. Oh my goodness, 7 degrees am I going to burn up? And yes, that's warm. I think. Mathematically, I understand the math, but a 38 degree shift, you know, that's much bigger. Here's another example, January 26, 2023. So that's this year, a few months back, right? The jet stream was way up in here, lots of rain up into Alaska, all the way down, rain throughout all Saskatchewan, yet if you went over uh, Lake Winnipeg and Manitoba, uh, quite cold. Right? That difference between Saskatoon and Winnipeg, you can get from quite warm to quite cold. You look at the forecast, you know, this is in, uh, again, January of 26, plus four, right? Minus 21. Yep. And a couple of days later, minus 21, right? So a 25 degree shift in three days. Back and forth, back and forth. We've been living this. Again, 2008, 2009, 2010, we started shifting. But it's only been about 12, 15 years, and that's about halfway through a 30 year period. So when you average it, we can't quite see and say, okay, we've got a 30 year window where it's changed. In three or four or five more years, we'll have many more of these kind of shifty winters, and we'll start to say, now that's normal. Versus our other normal, that's a dramatic shift in our climate change, okay? Can, are you able to tell us what the uh, computers that are used now for detecting or for making up these scenarios, um, what are they predicting for Saskatchewan over the next? Because I remember Elaine Wheaton, Dr. Wheaton used to do a lot of the computer modeling. And I remember uh, I, she was saying there was going to be more snow in the winter, come winter time, I think, uh, and certainly drier. So are those computer models, uh, is that what they're still predicting? Um, in short answer is yes. Yeah. And I believe you're talking about uh, climate change projections for like the next 50 to 100 years. Yeah. And the answer is yes. And I'll show you in the, even the next slide why they think it's a little bit wetter. And the wetter is coming in our winter again, storms. Because those lines, one side of it's hot, one side of it's cold. When you get hot and cold meeting, mm -hmm. usually you get precipitation. In the summertime it's rain, in the wintertime it's snow or rain, depending on which side of the line you're on. And so that's happening more, and so our snow sticks around a little bit more, and that's when we're gaining it. And then slightly lower in the summer, that's what the projections are. Yeah. I want to introduce something else, something else that most people in Saskatoon don't think of, and that's the Arctic Ocean. Right? 
the Arctic Ocean. So this is the sea ice from uh, April of 1979 when we started putting some of our first satellites up and we started looking at the north. And then we can map the sea ice in the, in the north. And that sea ice, ever since we started been mapping it from the 1980s all the way through, has been going down. What that means is less frozen over ocean and more open ocean. And when you think of it, winter time in an open ocean is either one's wavy and dark, and anybody who's wearing a dark t-shirt on a hot day know that you're absorbing the sun. So that's like the water, the open water is absorbing heat energy. And if you freeze it over, just think if you walked across the Saskatchewan lake in the winter time, it freezes over, the snow is on top, the wind howls over top of it, there's no wave action going on, everything is usually white and so you're reflecting away heat. So what we're doing with the North in the Arctic Ocean is we're changing it from a reflector of heat to an absorber of heat. We're getting more and more open water and that's absorbing that and that's changing things over. And just like you can watch the weather every day, you can watch the sea ice every day. And this is what I, I do sometimes, and this is uh, May 15th, so yesterday, uh, the sea ice that we got from yesterday. We are, this year, 2023, the blue line, so we're well below average of what we've had, long-term average, and they have the 2012 in there, that was one of the lowest recorded years ever for September ice, so they always put that dash line as an indicator of where we were. We're well below that. We're heading to new records, I guess, of low ice. We won't know. Usually it continues to melt all summer long until September, and that September that flips the switch, it starts to get cold more, and then we start to build up ice. So by September of some year, eventually, we're gonna have probably no ice there, right? And then we have to figure out what's happening. But you can watch the same thing that's happening in the north, and you see all those little bumps and jiggles on there? Yeah, some years, some days it got a little colder, then it went a little warmer, then a little colder, a little warmer, as it jiggles along that. And most of those jiggles up and down, you can follow them with the jet stream. You can predict what's happening with the jet stream. The same thing that's delivering our weather here is delivering the weather up north. And here's a, a good example. <coughs> I'll give you, this is for February 23rd, 2023, so a few months ago. Here we are, all this rain high up, the north part of Alaska is getting rain and snow, one side rain, one side snow on that jet stream, and this is that area that just didn't even freeze this year. This uh, didn't freeze, why? Because that warm air and all that rain is moving up, and to freeze ocean water you need to get a little colder than just zero. It's not like fresh water, it's salt water, and you got to get it down cold for some time. And those conditions never really were met. And so it stayed quite cold, or it's quite warm, unusually warm in this area. But you go over to Saskatoon on this day, look at that, we're in a deep freeze. We're really cold, really warm over here. We're up in the northern Alaska in the plus, plus areas, and we're over here in the minus 30s, right? Back and forth as that whips across. It's not an even going up and down, it's depending on where you are, east to west, you're going to be on a hot side or a dry side, on a cold side. Can you just tell us or tell me why the cold air, when the jet streams are streams uh, that far south, why and that allows the cold air? Why does the cold air uh, allow to move? Yeah, um, that far think south? of your house, maybe you're heating in the winter and you're cold. You're, you're having a nice warm house, and then someone comes and opens the door, and in comes a whole bunch of cold air, yeah. and you'll see that kind of steam along the ground, cold air sinks, mm -hmm. and it wants to hug the ground a lot. Warm air rises, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so that happens in your house and it happens here in our atmosphere too. So that cold air is really quite bullying and it bullies its way in, it pushes. and it pushes it down and it hugs the ground, and so it gets, it really hugs it down in the ground there. And so it takes an awful lot of force for the warm air to push it out. And that's kind of what's happening there. It's a fight between warm and cold, and it's a constant battle in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we look at on that day, on that February day or something, you can start to see and you can start to go, oh, it was really warm in here, and it starts to take a little twist, and you watch two or three days in a row. It's twisting down because all that warm air is up in Alaska, 
and then the next couple days, in comes the cold air, and then it goes back up and starts to make more ice. So you can watch that change daily, and you can everybody can go on this. It's just the NOAA site, type in Arctic air, and you'll see what, what it was, usually for one day behind you. And then what was happening in Saskatoon? Well, of course, extreme cold warning again. So minus 34 that night, minus 27 when I took this, and then that warm Rosby wave would come up. We'd cross over from the cold side to the dry side, and then we'd go from February, uh, Sunday to February 26, we went from minus 27, warmed up 20 more degrees, 20 degrees in a few days, right? Back and forth and back and forth. And minus seven, we're saying, hey, wonderful, I love it. But in the back of our mind, none of us is saying, oh, oh, it's supposed to stay actually quite cold for some yeah. weeks in a row or days in a row. Instead of every five days, we get a new um, side of the Ross, we wait inside of the jet stream. Okay? So in summary, this, the sea ice cover is also affecting the position of the polar jet stream, especially in winter. Um, there's strong evidence to suggest this. We can do all the modeling we want. We have enough data now that the more open water exists in the Arctic with that heat absorption again, that kind of darker t-shirt absorbing the heat energy just like the darker water would, there's more meridional flow. So more of that really crazy jet stream happening in the winter time. Conversely, in those sometimes when it gets less open water and we see less and less going, then we go back to that zonal jet stream, the zone just moving across to a north-south. And that differential that we're seeing in meteorology terms is called Arctic amplification. So they've even given it a whole new term because now in the last 20 years we're starting to see this happening more and more and they can explain it really good and we've really updated our daily weather forecast based on that kind of thing and we're seeing it happen a lot more. But aren't we here to talk about trees, <laughs> right? The answer is yes, we're here to talk about trees, but it's important to hit that what is happening in those trees world at certain times. Think of it as your tree. Here we are, uh, February 15th, 2022, the week before that last one, right? Minus 18, minus 8, minus 3, rain and plus 5, minus 17 the next day. It's going up and down like a yo-yo. Is it going to be above and raining? Or is it going to be really cold? Do I put my snowsuit away? Or where is it? Each day we don't know. Each week we don't know in the last few years. And this is what we've all been living here in Saskatoon. At least this one, it didn't have a, you know, a big red line across it saying it's super cold that night. But again, back and forth to the rain, to the no rain. And if you're a tree, you're trying to live through that. Now maybe it's not quite as important in the win winter because you're in dormancy, you're taking a, la a rest, but it's important in the next little part I'll kind of fade into what are the trees actually doing and how I study that. Here's that example of that big jet stream I think on uh, yeah, February 16th. And you can see a really sharp cold side and then a warm side coming back and forth and it's a really tight Rosby wave so the rain will pass over us really quick and then we're on the back side of it again and then you're into the cold weather. So hot, cold, hot, cold, back and forth in the middle of our winter. Right? That's the unusual part. Okay. Then you start to move further away from the Januaries and further away from the Februarys and get into the Marches and Aprils, when in our theory, we're getting into what we call spring, right? As soon as that Easter comes along, you're thinking spring and melting snow and all that. But we're starting to see a lot more of this, you know, incoming Colorado, well, once, uh, once again, takes aim at southern Saskatchewan. And this one is from uh, April 21st, 2022, right? So we're getting kind of a lot more of these. Uh, it's warmed up a lot, everything melted, and all of a sudden a really bad storm comes and drops, you know, 17, 20 centimeters of snow or something on these places, right? And if you're a tree, you're kind of listening to different signals. Some trees like to follow the photo period when the sun is changing, so that's kind of the same all the time, and you know where the sun is gonna be in the sky at certain time of years, but many of them follow the temperatures. As things start to warm up and the snow melts and the ground heats up, it sends signals to the trees, this is the time to wake up. Mm -hmm. And as I start to wake up, what's my weather gonna be like? I know what it's gonna be like, I've adapted to this for generations, I know what it's supposed to be like in spring, but boy, these last 10 to 15 years, our springs, 
are coming and going, and I'm getting hit with all these craziness. And depending on what cycle they're at, and when these things hit, you can really get offset and hurt the trees, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to kind of think along that line. Whether it's pussy little times of the leaves coming out or just coming out. And this weekend I really enjoyed that. It's kind of a lightish yellow green that the leaves have, especially the aspens. Just one of my favorite colors, right? You just come through dust season, if you want to call it that. And then you start to see that vibrant kind of greenish yellow come in. Beautiful, right? That's wonderful. And those trees are so susceptible if they suddenly got um, mm -hmm. a big frost. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm gonna move now into those trees and how I kind of look into that. That's part two of our story. This is some of my research sites. It's a boreal site, northern Saskatchewan kind of thing, but we have towers with cameras that are watching and we can have these every day. We take three or four images and you can kind of line them up. So this is that classic kind of summertime moving into fall. I took one of the cameras with the larch there, so the larch will turn color, they'll turn yellow, and then the leaves, or the needles will drop off. And so you can kind of see these larch, all the same images. But we, we can look at the forest and learn a lot about the forest and the timing of the forest when the snow comes, when there's still snow on the ground in the spring and when it wakes up and then the large start to, the new needles come out for that year. So I tend to watch these things through that annual cycle. And it's very interesting to me that to watch them for long term, not to move my experiments and just kind of be patient and watch and listen to what they do and see how they react to some of this strange weather that's happening. Um, in general, in the summertime, this is when the trees are growing. Their leaves are out, they're doing really well, they're growing as they want, they might be, uh, we're coming into pollen season, they might be getting ready for seeds and making babies and growing taller and sending out their roots for nutrients. All that is going on and it's a wonderful time to see the trees. In the fall, we go into like, we're getting ready to go to sleep in the winter. And I call it a dewatering stage. And everybody kind of understands this probably in, intuitively, but they might not think it from a tree's perspective. They'll, they'll, usually in the deciduous trees, they'll lose their leaves, and when they're doing that, they're signaling that I'm dewatering, I don't have enough to keep going, we don't need those leaves anymore, let's shed them for next year. And as that's happening in that time period, the tree starts to get all the sugars that are that it made up for the summer that are in the tree, and it takes them and it puts them away in a safe place, and that safe place is underground. underground. So it's de 